Good evening, my brother. Good evening, good evening, good evening. What's going on, Dr. Edward Woods III? How you doing, my brother? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's the Conscious and Justice Council. Um, Black History Celebration. We're back once again, once again, for the entire month of February, the entire month of February. And my, 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 what a show, what a show that we have scheduled um, for this evening. And we have an all-star lineup show for this week evening. Um, last week, we did a show on Black Resistance as our theme. It's the National Black History theme. It's not something that we made up. But every year, every year, they come up with a theme. And the theme for this year is Black Resistance. And it kicked off with Dr. Keith Burton. Go ahead and share about that. Oh, man, that that was a mighty word, Dr. Keith Burton. If you missed it, uh, we can always you can always go to the CJC uh, website uh, or you can go to our Facebook page uh, or you can just look up our our YouTube uh, page and you will find uh, the message from Dr. Keith Burton. Um, he was able to just lay it out, uh, empowering us, encouraging us, um, speaking truth to power. That's 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 what he did. Uh, but we were we were blessed tremendously. Uh, it, it was a tough word. Some some parts of it was a tough word. Uh, we, we dealt with sometimes how he dealt with how sometimes even in our history, we 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 enslaved ourselves. You know, not all skin folk uh, are kin folk. Uh, and, and he just, he just called it like it was and, and then held us to a higher standard, uh, how we also need, uh, to be holding one another accountable, um, uh, as, as, as we talked a little bit as, as well about the, the incident down there in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, with Tyree Nichols, man. And so, uh, we're praying, uh, for justice, not just in that situation, but all situations, uh, that we run up against. But tonight, man, we, we're going to chop it up. We've got some great uh, guests that are with us, and, and we're going to talk about black wealth. And so let's say a word of, well, should we oh, yeah, pray well, and get started? Um, let's say a word of prayer and get started. But for our listening audience, go out and tell your friends. Go out and tell your friends. Tell everybody to come to the Conscience and Justice Council. You can watch us on our Facebook page or YouTube channel. But we are about to drop a wealth of knowledge tonight um, with our guests. All right, Pastor Josiah, please offer prayer. All right, let's pray, everybody. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have once again to encourage and empower our people. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll be with the guests who have joined us. We know that some guests may not be able to make it. We pray for them as well and pray that all will be well with them and their families. Uh, continue to bless us tonight. Send your spirit uh, down and, and may what we've heard and, and may what we see uh, and experience, Lord, be a blessing to us. And may we share with others as well. In Jesus' name, we pray that all God's children said amen and amen. We want everybody to be digital evangelists tonight before uh, Elder Woods III shares uh, the introductions of those who are with us. Uh, we want you to go ahead and share what you have. Share, share your link. Uh, drop it on, share it on Facebook with your friends and family, share it on YouTube, whatever space you're in. Uh, if you're a pastor watching online, uh, feel free to share with your church family. If you're a conference administrator, go ahead and share that thing uh, with your pastors, with your churches. Uh, we want everybody, all of our people to be blessed tonight by what will take place in this place and in this space. All right, Edward Woods, go ahead and and share with us, man, who the guests that we've got on tonight. Well, we, we got a Dean Emeritus in the house. Hey. It's talking about having a Dean Emeritus. I mean, Amen. they've been teaching for so long, so well, for oh, so long. Oh, oh. And they gave them a stature <laughs> where they said, you know what? We ain't going to find anybody better. So let's make it a legacy. And we have Dr. Linda L. Ammons from Las Vegas, Nevada. And she's going to give us a historical aspect of black wealth. But, you know, she's a legal scholar. So, you know, there's going to be some legal things Ooh. teased in there. Oh, but yes. uh, she dropped the knowledge so hard, I, I couldn't take notes. I just had to listen and say amen and thank you. So I'm going <laughs> to let her do her thing in her own way um, with regards to this. And Dr. Ammons, once again, thank you for being with us and um, coming on with us. And we're going to back out the way and let you go ahead and talk about black wealth from a historical perspective. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, to the Woods Josiah team 
for inviting me uh, to participate in this this evening. And all emeritus means is that you're old, that's all, <laughs> and, and get out the way. But um, I, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about this topic, although this isn't a topic that, um, that makes me very happy considering uh, where we are at this stage in 2023. So let me just, I'm always wanting to know, well, how did we get to where we are? And most of us know that um, we came to this country as, as property. Um, and so now th what we're trying to do, property as we were defined as a people are trying to get property, uh, that which we are entitled to um, and that we have been denied. Wealth is based on property. It's just as, as simple as that. Uh, it, during the enslavement era, although a few blacks were free um, and some of the freed helped in the Underground Railroad, uh, particularly Northern free African-Americans. But at that time in 1863, the enslaved were worth $3 billion. That's not an M, that's a B, billion dollars. And if you just think about it, uh, African-Americans created wealth for this country and their masters for 246 years. And I don't have time to go through all of it because I've only got five minutes. So let me just speed ahead. So chronologically, you've got the Civil War. And during the Civil War, uh, 200,000 black men fought in the Civil War. Special Order 15, the 40 acres and a mule, was only in effect for one year. Uh, that was the property redistribution that was supposed to happen, and it only happened to a few. Well, you know, uh, actually about three or four days after Johnson signed that order, he was assassinated. A after Abraham Lincoln signed that order, he was assassinated. And uh, Johnson came into the Oval Office as president, and he immediately reversed it, which meant thousands of blacks were evicted from their lands, That those who, who got some land. Then we go to the era of debt peonage uh, from slave crop, sharecropping, uh, prison labor for the tiniest infraction. By 1877, the North gets tired of reconstruction and withdraws from the South. We have the black codes. And in the 1890s, the elite whites want to strip blacks of their citizenship. In 1896, we have Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, which is a separate but equal in the Jim Crow area. But let me back up just a little bit. Um, the HBCUs were created in 1837 with Cheney University, uh, then the University of DC, Lincoln University, and then Wilberforce. And uh, between that time and 1851, there was a, a league called the National Negro Business League, which was founded uh, by Booker T. Washington. Blacks sought to own, we wanted to own our own labor. Mutual aid societies evolved into banks and to credit unions. And from 1880s to 1920s, more than 100 black banks had charters. Uh, in St. Louis, I don't know whether this bank is still in operation, but the St. Louis Penny Bank was organized by a woman by the name of Magdalena Walker in 1903. Now, in, during that same time period, and someone I think is going to be on the panel tonight to discuss this, we have the race riots and the loss of wealth. Before Tulsa, 1829, in the north, in Cincinnati, race riots drove over 2,000 blacks from the United States to Canada. In 1898, there were race riots in Wilmington, Delaware. And then we get to the red summer of 1919, and according to a New York Times report, uh, depending on how you count, between 38 uh, separate uh, race riots instigated by whites and 70 different incidents took place across the country, which resulted in lynchings and the loss of property. Of course, you have the Tulsa riots of, uh, of 1921. Uh, the deaths were somewhere between 100 and 300, but official records say 37. Individuals in family-owned households, uh, the family home households fell by 6.3%. And one statistic says this, if 1,200 median-priced homes in Tulsa today were destroyed, the loss would be around $150 million of wealth. Now you add additional losses of property and assets 
and that loss would come up to well over $200 million. Um, during the Jim Crow era of the 1940s and 50s, we began to work in factories uh, but, and went off to the war. But as you all know, blacks could, soldiers could not take advantage of the GI Bill uh, or the federal uh, FHA Bill. And while the white middle class was being, um, was evolving because of these government programs, uh, between 1930 and 1960, less than 2% of African Americans were able to get homes and loans from the VA or the FHA. Well, let me just close with this because I see my time is, is running very quickly here. Uh, when you fast forward to today uh, and what is going on today, uh, the, we all have been alive, I suppose, during the subprime crisis of 2008, but it began before uh, it went to the mainstream. In 2008, though, Black communities lost 53% of the wealth. A bank, in particular, Wells Fargo, targeted black churches to give seminars and sell subprime loans. And Wells, however, we sued them, and Wells ended up paying $175 million in settlements. But that wealth is gone, just like the wealth was gone after people uh, left, just left, uh, when whites came in and looted during the riots. And here's a statistic that may just make you sad. It will take 228 years for African Americans to reach the level of wealth white households hold today, 228 years. The Rand Corporation says that the average value of an inheritance for African Americans is $100,000 and the average uh, for whites, $195,000. And I focused on uh, housing in particularly because home equity accounts for two thirds of all wealth. In addition to being denied the opportunity to, to have homes, to be sold, um, sub, uh, to be redlined uh, into particular uh, neighborhoods, to be sold prime subprime loans on appraisals, it's estimated that Black and Latino households have their homes appraised up to, up to $500,000 less than expected. Um, so the bottom line is, uh, we are still in a, a, a big struggle in terms of equity and equality. Uh, white Americans uh, have 13 times the median household wealth of African Americans. And for you young people out there who are graduating from the various schools, we have to borrow a, um, and pay at much higher interest rates than any other groups. Eight out of 10 black graduates have to, to borrow. So um, here's a last statistic. When you think about how we struggle to first become free and then to own our own property and then to keep our property and not be harassed, killed, bombed, shot, run out, um, um, swindled, uh, and we ask for things in terms of a remedy and people say, well, we can't afford to do it. Here's a statistic for you and I'll close with this. The richest 1% in this country own as much wealth as the entire middle class. And those who have been fortunate enough to gain that wealth didn't do it by pulling up their bootstraps. I'll just close with that. Wow. You're you're muted. Ella, yeah, trying you? to let the dust settle. But that was a lot of information. We weren't going to cut you off. <laughs> oh no, you, we were done. We, so you could have kept going because yeah, you were you, running. But wow, <laughs> <laughs> what I thought you say is wow, wow, wow. That's all and I can so, say. But thank you for that historical analysis. And Marvin Earl, Marvin Earl, who is the um, access to capital manager for the state of Colorado is in the house. We had to chase him down because, you know, usually somebody else is shopping, but it was him that was shopping. 
<laughs> and he was the one that pushed us to do the show. And then I'm not, I'm not going to say you just sent me the link, Ed. I'm going to pretend like well, you, you can say fault. that, but you had the link three hours ago like everybody else. <laughs> I got the email. Wow. But it's good that you're here, my brother. Turn your camera around the other way. Turn it the other way. How so we get that? a full that There better? you go. Beautiful. And you're here I to think, talk to I us. Think that was outstanding. You having me come behind that home run hitter, uh, uh, Council Ed, Edmonds. She really, she really laid out some, some great statistics, and they seem sort of uh, um, damaging. They seem sort of uh, disparaging, but however, there is a light in the tunnel, and I want to speak about how we can just come out of this tunnel that she eloquently listed. You know, there are nine regional conferences in our North American division. And I want you to know there's only one credit union, I think, that is in existence. And that is the one in Northeastern Conference, uh, uh, my home city, my home state rather. If the millennials, if those who are emancipated, if those who truly want to exercise some black wealth uh, 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 renaissance within the Adventist church, Excuse if me, brother we, Earl. We could just get your face right into the mic. I mean, into the that? camera. There how you go. That? How about so that? Go back a little bit so we can see you. How about that? And then put your head down a little. How about there that? There you go. Perfect. Now, is that perfect? All right. If we were to start a movement, which we can do, and impress upon our nine regional conferences to begin a credit union, which would take less than $100,000 between nine regional conferences and probably two million black Adventists in this nation, we would have the number one financial credit union in the world. We could, we could jettison to that statistic immediately if that mentality was preached from the pulpits, from our campgrounds, that particular mentality is not being preached. And for another day and for another time, I'll give you my reasons why. But we can immediately address a lot of the percentage that council, uh, 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 our counselor, uh, Linda Edmonds, talked about. We can jettison ourselves to one of the premier financial institutions in the country by creating our own credit union. It's faster and easier to create a credit union than it would be a bank. A CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, is probably the second easiest. For some odd reason, that type of mentality has never been preached from the Black Adventist pulpit. That's one of the real killers of Black wealth. I'll tell you another thing. This um, presenter, I don't know when Elder McCoy presented, if he did present, but the mentality and courage that he exemplified in creating our retirement fund for our valued workers, our preachers, our pastors in the Adventist work, had that courageous movement continued by the Black Wall Street mentality, we would be far down the track of Black wealth, accumulation, stability, and growth if we would hear that from our podium. That has never been a prerequisite from our, our podium. And sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We just had some uh, some having some technical diff difficulties with um uh Marvin Earl's um signal there. Uh but hopefully you're still with us and and I have heard uh that sentiment shared. As we wait for him to come back on, uh, he just said that that it will take less than a hundred thousand uh, dollars to create a credit union. Yes, uh, you're back. All right, okay. I would just con continue rolling. We lost you for a minute there because uh, Oakwood College, everyone had a credit union, and we right. sold it to Red uh, Stone Credit Union. We had a bakery. We we had all of the financial incomes. And, and income streams that uh, uh, um, the, the HBCUs set aside for all of our HBCUs. All of them had income streams. 
all of them had businesses. For some particular reason, we've sold all of our income streams for whatever reason. And this is why the black wealth amongst our institutions owned by blacks is almost, it, it, it's, it's not even existent. And that whole mentality and thinking has to change. We can pivot and make that change and address those inequalities that Linda was talking about. It's just the will, the courage, and the interest to do it. And if I could add, okay, since if I could add or, or ask a question real quick since we still uh -huh. have you. Brother Earl, so so I think for some of the younger generation like myself, uh -huh. you know, we've heard about the credit unions. We've heard uh -huh. about various um, ways where wealth can be uh, built, not just for the institutions. So so yes. I'm not I'm not just talking about it. It's about two hundred and twelve million, two hundred and thirteen million in tie that the regional conferences bring in per year. Uh -huh. um, and of course, we have assets, we have buildings, we have all those but you're talking about wealth of the people, the, the, the actual people. If it takes $100,000 to start a credit union, you said is about that. That's, that's a, an estimate. Then I think that is within reach. I think that is a possibility. I think it is, but, but some of us haven't heard that. And I've got a couple of degrees in business. You know, I wanted to do that. Kind of wanted to, to go my own way. Um, uh, but the Lord, the Lord saved me and brought me into the ministry. However, just the way I think and process, I think if we can do that for our people. Uh, well, it takes it takes a certain I didn't mean to cut you off, but it takes, oh, no, go ahead. It takes a certain emancipated leadership oh. to understand and appreciate the economics and politics of the Adventist message. Our message, our Christianity, our religion, our third angel's message is true. It's right. It's from the word of God. Where we have lost and where African Americans have been silent on this colonialism and this redlining that. that uh oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. We that has to come from our leadership. We are we are right now at a crossroads of a leadership vacuum change. We have had the old style um wink and nod. Uh, 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 preach the message and no one has ever preached the black Wall Street mentality for whatever oh. reason. I have some ideas as to why that is, but you can look all across the board throughout the Adventist uh, 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 culture, the NAD. Pine Forge looks a whole lot different than Blue Mountain. Uh, all of our universities, all of our churches, all of our facilities are totally different. It, there is a separate, unequal type of Jim Crow that has been allowed. Every Adventist talks about it at Sabbath dinner. We all know it. We just oh. don't have the courage to say enough is enough. Our, well, our, there just it, it, needs to be that movement, that protest, that revolution. And we don't have that spirit because for some odd reason, Adventists, Black Adventists think that when you go down that emancipation road, that isn't what the Lord has for us. And that's the most incorrect, uh, 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 crazy idea throughout our community. And that's why our community has suffered. It hasn't been because we didn't have the will. It hasn't been because we didn't have the education and the knowledge. We just never had a desire to step away from this... Um, colonialism and i'll give you a case in point pastor carlton bird pull, pull your pull your year, pull your camera back again there we go now pastor we see you. carlton bird last year generated in ties 14 million dollars first time ever in that conference history but 44 percent of that money had to go to the general conference this is why our church schools our facilities our buildings are in a deplorable crumbling state because we cannot return that investment back into our inner cities, back into our major academies, other than Oakwood Academy. That's why we don't have that return on investment. So the younger crowd, the millennial crowd, when they see that that's not happening, they're not going to pay tithe into a system where there's no return on investment. 
They'll go to a charter school. They'll go somewhere else. They'll come to alumni weekend and they'll, they'll, they'll participate, but they will not put into a system that is unequitable. And for some odd reason, those pastors, those heroes, that, and you see them every Sabbath on, on YouTube. They preach every week on Breath of Life. They don't preach the, the black Wall Street mentality. The Jews do it. The Asians do it. The Middle Easterners do it. Every race and every oppressed color that has immigrated to this country preaches that mentality. But us. Oh. We'll we'll preach the third angel's message, but we'll stop when it comes to oh. hey, should we separate and emancipate ourselves from oh. a system that's unequal, racist, and for all intents and purposes, has never been fair since 1844. Well, there's a a, a lot to unpack there, um, Brother Earl, that you shared. I know Dr. Ammons wanted to get back in. And I also want to bring in um, Dr. William T. Cox, who is the um, executive director of the Regional Retirement Plan, yes, but also a former president, because, you know, there's we want to make sure we have some, uh, how can I say, um, not just a lament, but also a resolution as to how do we get there. So I want to bring both of them on. But um, Dr. Ammons, I know you wanted to say something. So we'll let you go first, and then after that, we'll hear from Dr. Cox. Is someone to speak, or Dr. Ammons is on mute? I mean, her. I'm not able to hear her sound. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm in a mall buying my wife a Valentine's gift. That, that's so I'm all trying right. to stay married. That's all right. Well, we'll have Dr. Cox go while we wait for Dr. Ammons. Well, it's certainly a, a privilege and a pleasure to um, be here uh, representing the Regional Conference Retirement Plan. And if there is something that gives value to what uh, Mark Nero has said in terms of what we are able to do if we come together, certainly the Regional Conference Plan has, has shown that. Um, back I in just... The, the Back in the 70s, the regional conference uh, leadership uh, just was, very briefly was saying to the church as um, leadership that as uh, regional conferences, we were overpaying into a retirement system that was uh, woefully inadequate to our needs. The term regional has become known uh, from an ethnicity perspective, but in reality, regional has to do with territory. And as a result, the nine regional conferences with a large amount of territory that they, that, um, they supported, um, it was a greater burden on the workers who were moved around um, systematically um, to be able to, uh, in many instances, uh, become vetted in retirement programs, particularly where their spouses, uh, professional spouses were uh, working. And as a result, um, the retirement program was underutilized by us. Now, please understand that in the old sustentation um, program, um, you had to work 40 years in order to be um, uh, get full compensation. And after 40 years, your compensation was somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to $900 uh, a month. Um, what happened in the middle 90s was that um, the church recognized that um, we were unable to maintain a defined benefit uh, program. The difference between the two kinds of retirement plan is one is a defined benefit, the other is a defined contribution. 
The defined benefit program means that the organization has responsibility or liability for your retirement. A defined contribution plan means that the individual has responsibility for investing their uh, retirement um, uh, or a portion of their uh, uh, of their salary, and then determining how that investment uh, fared would then determine how you would do in terms of your retirement uh, years. Uh, Elder Joseph McCoy um, really was the visionary of the retirement uh, program, and he said to the North American Division, with the support of uh, eight of the conferences that we are going to do a defined benefit plan for our workers. Now, it took some courage. Uh, individuals uh, don't realize uh -huh. that those eight conferences that started off with, probably I shouldn't say this, huh, withheld the monies that were uh, identified for retirement for a year. And at that point, um, the North American Division, they did an actuarial study. They found out that the NAD plan was woefully uh, underfunded. They were underfunded by $1.4 billion. And so the North American Division decided to move from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. But those eight conferences um, stood tall and said, we're going to do this for our workers. Now, uh, Jan Paulson, who was the president of the General Conference, um, actually um, ordered a actuarial study to see whether or not the regional conferences had overpaid. And they found out that there were 15 conferences in the North American division. There are 59 conferences in the North American division that 15 of them had overpaid into the retirement plan. The first eight were all regional conferences. One through eight were regional conferences. The ninth conference was Florida conference and the 15th conference was Northeastern conference, which means that all nine of the regional conferences uh, had overpaid. Uh, and the leadership stuck together, decided that they were going to pool their funds. The North American division says, if you do this, you're on your own and they had the courage to do it. So that uh, now, some 23 years uh, later, we are a little less than $300 million in terms of resources for our uh, retirees. So that a retiree in the regional conference plan um, you get vested not in 10 years, but in five years. And you don't have to work 40 years in order to get full retirement. You work 30 years. So the average worker now, if you work 30 years in a regional conference, when you retire, uh, will retire with, uh, along with Social Security, 105% of your current salary. I tell you, that enables you to retire with a sense of dignity. Right. That should give us the initiative and the reality. This is not a guess. It, it is a reality of what we are able to do if we are willing to come together. Exactly. By, the, by exactly. the grace of God, by the grace of, of God. Um, we just uh, finished uh, building a $9 million building on Oakwood's uh, campus. It's the Charles Dudley uh, Center. 
Within that center, there is a, a museum in terms of what is what the history of the regional conferences uh, in North America and what they have produced. And we also have a cultural center, the Joseph uh, McCoy Cultural Center that gives a history of, of the retirement plan. And if we are willing to come together as one, there is no telling what we are able to do. The final thing that I would say is God recognizes the gifted, giftedness that he has placed within us. In uh, Genesis, you hear the story of the Tower of Babel. And God comes down and sees what the individuals are doing and declares, if these people stay together, there is nothing they will not be able to accomplish. And so God, in order to thwart that option, changes the languages of individuals so that they started, they weren't able to communicate accurately with one another. We are able to communicate uh, accurately to one another. If we want to make change, we can make change. It's up to us to do it. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, we have Daryl Thomas. I want to bring him on. Um, Daryl Thomas is the president, founder, and CEO, CEO of Thomas Consultants in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was exciting when I went to visit the Church of God in Christ Convention, um, along with the Bishop of the African, um, African American Adventist Association, none other than Jesse Wilson himself, was at the Midnight Musical. We found out that the sound system, the sound system that the Church of God in Christ used at the historic Mason Temple was done by Thomas Consultants. Matter of fact, Bishop Sheard himself in comparing the sound system at Mason Temple versus the convention center was proud to say we have a way better sound system. And he said wireless, wireless, wireless system, wireless. The wireless was better at the, um, at the Mason Temple than the convention center. And that was because of D.K. Thomas, Thomas Consultants, Chairman and CEO. And then Daryl Thomas has been a um, longtime member of the Breath of Life Church, but also on the executive committee. And Daryl, if you can talk and address Marvin Earl's question um, that he um, ended with, and then come back on and tell us about Black Wealth from your perspective, that would greatly appreciate it. Once again, thank you, brother, for being here this yes. evening. <clears throat> now, Thank you. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, privileged to be here. And, and you know, I, I'm excited to come behind Dr. Linda, uh, Marvin Arrow, <clears throat> Dr. Cox. <clears throat> I'm a trustee as well of the, I'll start there with the retirement plan. Marvin, you were talking about, there were some powerful things and why don't we come together? That's to how steelers do, Daryl. You know that. That's right. But my, you know, my thing, Marvin, I, I'll, I'll give you all some personal examples that hopefully will inspire young people who are watching this. You know, you talk about starting our own financial institution. I'm a big believer in that. Yes. Uh, back in 19, in Memphis in 1946, Dr. Walker, Jay Walker, he was a physician, started uh, Tri-State Bank and Universal Life Insurance, which was the largest uh, uh, black insurance company in the nation at the time. And I've been, I was fortunate to do business. To this day, I still bank with, it's now Liberty Bank. Liberty out of uh, New Orleans bought Tri-State Bank and Liberty is, I think they, is, they bought a billion dollars in assets, about the largest black bank. But <clears throat> in 1990, we started another bank and one of your own, me, Daryl Thomas, we put $5 million and started a state bank called Memphis First Community Bank. And today in 2023, that bank is $26 billion. Uh, uh, and I'm a part of that bank, it's called Simmons Bank now. Uh, very large bank, but it goes to show when when black people uh, uh, come together. Yes. These people are not Seventh-day Adventists. You know, they're, they're believers, 
when we come together, there's nothing we can't do. But what I, I, I hitting on what Marvin mm. said, why our churches have not done this, we're in battles right now. That that's a you, you hit that on the head, Marvin. That's a leadership thing. Yeah, we'll go no further than our leadership. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, blocks are put there. You know, Dr. Cox mentioned the almost three hundred million dollars uh, uh, in assets of our retirement plan, but there that that's a wonderful thing that we're doing there. And that's why I volunteer to be a, a trustee there. But we can do so much more with that. Marvin, that is the largest, that is the largest pool of resources we have in the black work is the retirement plan. There's nothing larger than that. And, and, and some of our goals on the trustee side is to, and, and we're in a battle with this right now, Marvin, is to create jobs for our people to get where they can make high six figure income and live way above the poverty line but we we meet a lot of resistance i'm i'm sad to say from within our own ranks because that's not the goal one thing that keeps us down dr linda is most of us are worried about someone making more money than us uh oh you know and 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 everyone knows i i i, I talked pretty pretty direct and straight and and that keeps us back and it's a mentality that's taught in our church culture that's one thing that holds us back. Uh, you know, my church, Breath of Life, we're a small church, but uh, uh, I dare I put us against anyone with our resources on the church, on the local side. You know, everyone likes to say how much time they, they, their church turns in, but I always judge churches on how much do you keep at your local church, you know, to where you can do things within your church to provide jobs. And we teach our people to build wealth. And, and it is a we, we are taught from the top down, Marvin, that there's virtue in poverty. And, and there's no that that is not biblical. Being poor does not make you close to Christ. But we think that there are poor people that are going to hell. It, it I have no belief that we, we, we'll teach our people that if you're wealthy, that's a sinful thing. And that's just not true. Uh, 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 you know, I, I mentioned in a meeting when we were in Long Beach, you know, I'm one of those at the old school. I'm 58 years old, but Dr. Linda, I don't care if I make $10 million in a year, 20% of that goes to tithe and offers. I'm one of those 10 plus 10 people. And the law is, is still in the blessing business, guys. You know, it, it I, and, and, and Edward, I'm going to go on into what you brought me on here to talk about, about building black wealth. You know, Marvin, I know you want to talk about Black Wall Street. There were people from Memphis who went there. These these people went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I took I drove my family one Sabbath evening up from Memphis to Tulsa. My wife was like, where are we going? And I said, we're going to Tulsa. For what? We're going to see Black Wall Street. And it it's, it's nothing like what it used to be there. I mean, they've commercialized it. But when I was there, it's just it's an amazing thing to understand what happened there. These were people that were just tired of being killed, their, uh, uh, the struggle. So they all went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, built their own community on their side of the railroad track. They had their own hospital, banks, airlines. It's, there are so many different businesses they had. They were totally self-sustained. And they were like, we'll stay on our side. They had everything they needed. But the white people could not stand that. So what did they do? They went and killed these people. They bombed them. If you all, I know a lot of you all don't listen to, don't know who Gap Band is, but Charlie Wilson and Gap Band had a song, You Dropped a Bomb on Me. You know, Charlie Wilson is from Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's what that song was about, Marvin. I don't know if you knew that. They bombed Tulsa, Oklahoma and, 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 and destroyed these people. And, and that's the same thing is happening with us. We're killing the dreams when our people want to make it. And I said to our young people, don't listen to anyone who will tell you it's sinful to have wealth because it's not. You can do things the right way. And, and it's about being in business has afforded me so many opportunities 
to do things to where I'm not controlled by anyone. When you got enough money, you create your own way. And all of this is by the grace of God. Understand that I'm talking about the Christian way of doing this, but you, you don't have to bow to anyone when you have economic freedom. Mm -hmm. I submit to you all that Martin Luther King, as long as he was doing the civil rights thing, they were okay with that. But he, his eyes got open to economic freedom. That's mm -hmm. when he was taken out. Because when we're economically free, guys, ladies and gentlemen, there is no stopping you. No stopping you. And, and then what people will call you is arrogant. That, that, that's because they can't. Mercy, control. mercy. That, that, that's always a title given to people who are independent. And people despise, especially a black man who's independent, that has his own wealth. And that's what I'm about building net worth. You can't pay, I don't care how much money your job pays you, you can't pass that on to your children. You don't inherit jobs. If you work at FedEx, they pay you $10 million a year, you die, that's over with. But if you have net worth, you, you can pass your net worth on to generations. And it's time for us to start building generational wealth. And the only, the only way you can do that is typically through ownership. You know, I, that was a, a, a rich uh, a kid from this family. I won't name them. He went to college and I, the, the media followed him to school and he quit after a few weeks. They said, why did you quit? He said, they were teaching me to get a job. He said, I'll never get a job. And that's what school does. Now, I want everyone to go to college. You do not get me wrong on that. But we should we should go to college to learn to create jobs and not to get jobs. Uh -huh. Now, there are some exemptions I have to that, for that. Teachers and preachers. We need teachers. We need preachers. And that's why anyone that knows me on the South Central Conference Executive Committee, I fight. I say our teachers and our preachers do not make enough money. That's I true. Amen. That's where I, I go. Christian Josiah's hurt. <laughs> Amen. I am. I, I am. want our people to be empowered. So when, when you pass the breath of life, church, you're not concerned about how you're going to pay your bills. We take care of our pastor because that's a, an important job. And our school teachers, that was a very important job. But what if we had a church that everyone in the church is poor? Why, that, that would make no sense, guys. How is that a witness to the world that everyone in the church is dirt poor? No way. When my Lord says he counts his cattle by the mountains that they own, he says, I own cattle on a thousand hills. There is nothing I believe that our young people cannot do. There's nothing I cannot do. And I think big, you know, I'm one of those who believe, Marvin, that, that Jesus was a black man, that Adam and Eve were black people. So we're royalty. So mm -hmm. because of that, I respect Dr. Cox. I respect uh, uh, Josiah. I respect Wood. I respect Dr. Linda. It, it's we we won't kill ourselves, kill each other when we understand who we really are. Mm. You know, I have a passion That's about good. that. You know, and, and 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 wealth. You know, I'm I'm blessed. Being in business, Woody has afforded me. I've shown you some things when we sat down to talk. Have built a. a, a, a assisted living centers. One of them right there in Huntsville. And these are high end assisted living centers. You know, they uh, that that people have to pay serious money to be in. A Seventh day Adventist black man is in investing in these type of projects. That's building generational wealth. I can lay in bed and still get paid. That passive income, we have to get to that point. Even if you're a preacher, mm -hmm. you don't have to, you can have other sources of revenue. But we don't teach that. There are so many things that we can do. And that's one of the things that I'm fighting for with, with our retirement plan from the trustee point of view is to use those funds, leverage that to build an institution that can employ our people. But I'm I, I'm sad to say we don't, that dream, that's not the goal of our current leadership in our church. I'm not picking on Elder Cox. I, this this is a mentality in our church. White people want us silent. As long as what they call getting along is they control the money, 
then I don't care anything about us what you all do as long as we control the money. Mm. That's I think it. that's yeah. just the reality, you all. And and, right. and I've heard our leaders say, "Well, the Lord wouldn't want us to do you all." They used Jesus to keep us down. Mercy. So we got to stop doing that. And I'm not afraid to say it. Mercy. You know, mercy. Mercy. I'm not I, even excited. You would think because we have a black at the a black president of the NAD, a black president of the Southern Union. Do you think that has changed anything for us? Now I know you all don't like that. I'd like to talk about the gorilla that's let, in this room. Well, let, let's get let's get Dr. Adams, Dr. Am, Dr. Linda wanted to share something. Uh, good stuff, there. Good stuff. Uh, and we're gonna get back to some of what you said, but Dr. Adams, we can't hear you, and then we're gonna get to to Brother Earl. Yeah, we're not hearing. Oh, she said, looking to. Look. Okay, so I'm gonna have Elder Woods uh, look at the chat for for Dr. Adams and. Uh, Elder Earl, go ahead. In Maine, Arkansas is another example of destroyed black wealth. Yes. Can anybody speak to that? What? What? Say that again. Elaine, Arkansas. Elaine, Arkansas is another example of destroyed black wealth. Does uh, anyone know what happened in Elaine, Arkansas? Yes, yes, yes. But I would really like to change, change the 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 the, the discussion. Everyone on this panel probably can tell you about instances of black wealth, black cities, black Wall Streets, black communities being bombed, robbed, uh, 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 destroyed, all of that. What I want to talk about is the gorilla that's in the room. When, 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 when Billy was talking about the courage that Joe McCoy exemplified, and I want you to know a lot of very well-respected Adventist black men did not go along with that. They didn't want that. And nobody wants to go back to that system. What I would like to do is history and talking about all of the bombings and what have you that has been done to our people, we can talk about that till Jesus comes. What I want to talk about is we know that there is an, an equity we know how we can fix it, as Daryl has talked about. We need to get off the pot and start it. Because if we don't, this time next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, what has happened to so many of our retirees that did not benefit from what Elder McCoy put in, in place will die on the vine. And I do not think it's biblical. I do not think it's uh, 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 anti-Adventist and anti-Jesus Christ for us to emancipate ourselves away from this colonialism. That's good. It That's has good. not worked. The system has not worked. The tithing, the, the revolving fund, the three-way uh, scholarship fund, all of these barriers, all of these uh, uh, systemic racist right. barriers have, have held us back. We are the most gifted, preaching, evangelistic, baptizing, singing group of people in this message. If we emancipated ourselves from that, we would have far more than what Billy was talking about we just built and constructed. We would be so far down the road, but someone in the pulpit, someone over there in Silver Springs, Maryland, has convinced our leadership and our thinking that this is not what the Lord wants for us. So check this out. So let me, let me, let's, let's, there's a question in the chat. There's a question in the chat that I want us to get to, cause I'm very uh, curious. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up here. It says the question was, would it be FDIC insured? This is going back to the question about a credit, credit. union is not FDIC insured. That's okay. through the credit union. Go ahead and explain that Daryl. How that works it's easier to create it's better it it it, 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 it works for our faith-based ministry our a faith. whole lot better okay. than your yes. regulations through the fdic and also that she also asked was it was would it be fdic insured and mutual fund investment available so you or daryl can address that question you're mixing the two yeah well that, i'm just reading the question that that yeah. someone asked yeah. a, a, a credit union operates totally different than okay. an fdi insured state bank or national bank uh, anytime you want to in, enter 
interject, Daryl. Go ahead. No, he, he's right. Uh, uh, the credit unions, they are regulated, but not by the FDIC. So, you know, your funds are not secured that way. Okay. Your credit unions are membership based. Members. Got uh, it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's a simpler way of, you know, doing things. It takes a, a banks are much more highly regulated uh, to be in a, a, a state chartered bank. Back then, it took $5 million. So he's right. It, it, the the threshold is so much lower to, to start a credit union. So 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 the 100000 is like seed money, um, and then you get membership. Yeah, exactly. That that gentleman that I'm not I'm not the brightest person on the panel, but that doesn't sound that doesn't sound too hard. That doesn't at least to me that the, the numbers numbers don't lie and make sense. I'm gonna go back to something quickly that Dow mentioned. Here uh, in Colorado, here in Colorado, the the, the Congolese and Senegalese uh, uh, people from the Sudan started a credit union, uh -huh. and they are now making loans where they don't charge interest to their members. Come on now. Okay, okay. So let me let me let me push it a little bit more, uh, because because Dow mentioned um, uh, whether it be leadership that may not have the vision. Uh, I know that when they were starting in 2000 with the uh, retirement plan, you know, they, they, they came together. A lot of our leaders, they put their heads together. They pounded out what that vision would look like. Maybe we need those kind of, exactly. of, of spaces because sometimes somebody might be, be willing, but they haven't seen they haven't seen the vision. They haven't laid it out. So, well, so we you, don't... Have, you, you have to understand there is the enabler. And uh -huh. there is the emancipator. Okay. Both of them are black. There's okay. one that enables the system, and then there's one that will emancipate that system. Joe McCoy, Charlie Joe, Elder Dugley, my uncle, the list goes on. Uh, 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 Earl uh -huh. Moore, uh -huh. those folks were emancipators. They were not enablers. Enablers. Got it. Got it. So so what I'm what I'm hearing is if we if we get some emancipators together i'm not right. talking about people that want to leave the church right. i mean i believe in the message just like you said uh elder earl uh but no you call but, me marvin elder is uh, my uncle i'm not in the well, divinity well, yet listen no nah, man you you're my senior so you're my elder i i just that's out of respect but 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 i think i think that there may be some emancipators around within the ranks in leadership as well but we, but it needs to be, it needs to be an organized the people, movement. The people have the power. The, oh, the, we oh, can yeah. flesh oh, yeah. out. We can flesh out who the enablers and who the emancipators are. What gotcha. has happened is racism has now lowered the bar where I can right. move to a community. I can send right. my child to charter school. I can okay. marry uh, uh, out of my race. I can do so many things now that I couldn't do in '65 and '75. Got you. Got and, you. Okay, well, let's, let, me, um, let me throw something in there. Sure, Marvin, yeah. you that was something. Uh, it may have been Dr. Linda Ammons. I, I, I've been saying Dr. Lemon because I hate to say people's names wrong. Linda, is it Ammons? Or oh, am I saying this yeah. right? Okay, right. Doc, we, we talked about neighborhoods. I'm one of those beliefs. When you, when you look at the people that went to uh, uh, Tulsa, they built their own community. Yes. What do most of us do? When we get, when we think we have arrived, we I'm, move, move, I'm moving to the suburbs. I know That's that right. answer. I'm getting away from y'all. And we move into white communities. <laughs> I tell people, I, I'm of the age, I'm 58, where I, I was in, I was in the second grade when busing started. I, third grade, I started busing. That was the worst thing that happened to me when they took me out of a black community school, base school, and, and I went to a white school on the outskirts of Memphis. Where I went to school early on, all the teachers lived in the neighborhood. Right. I saw them when I played outside. And we took all of that away. We should build our own communities. All it takes is money to build a community when resources are put in. But to do that, we, we have bought into this thing that we are afraid of one another. We, 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 and, and all of us are saying we're not. And, and if we're afraid of ourselves, I'm not afraid of black people. Josiah, I would I have more confidence in you than I do your white counterpart. We are brilliant people. <laughs> well, praise God. Okay. <laughs> but 
what we do, let's look at the retirement plan because I was on, uh, uh, I was with Elmer McCoy. I was on the executive committee when this was started. Who do we go to to handle all of our, what what we think is black people. Are they vilified McCoy, Daryl. To, to handle this. So we have to give our money to white people. Let them handle this. I'm just calling it like it is. And I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, by the way. And, and I'm not, because I love us don't mean I hate white people. That That is not the case. I love all people. But I am a believer in taking, uh, uh, one of my white friends asked me in Memphis, we have a powerful black business director. He said, why do you all have to have a black business director? I said, well, you all had a yellow pages. I, I said, mm. this is for us, for our people to do business with our own people. But my thing is, we don't think we're smart enough to put our funds and we manage our own funds, you all. We don't think we're smart enough. Do you know of, of the black banks? I mentioned Liberty Bank, one of the largest in the nation. They're only a billion dollars. We started our bank in 1990. It's over five, uh, uh, 26 billion now. It's because it's not a black bank. What are you eating, Dan? Our people do oh. not trust. We've been taught not to believe in. And Marvin, that would be one of the challenges that you would have with starting a credit union. Our people won't utilize it because we're not taught that way. We got to start teaching kids young folk they have to see black enterprise they have to see us doing positive things creating jobs the young people at my church we have several entrepreneurs at our church so they see this they know man when i grow up i want to i want to be a barber but i want to build a serious barber shop where i got several locations in multiple states we're teaching mm. them that way when you yeah. have that, then Josiah, your mm -hmm. church, your conference won't have any problems with revenue. Then I got you. I got okay, it. Um, Dr. Cox, you've heard a lot. You've been a president of Allegheny West, you're the executive director of the regional retirement plan. Uh, what will it take for us to come together? Uh, Unity. Like with the retirement plan. What will it take for us to come together for credit unions Unity. or any other? avenues you know how do we, how do we get that unity to make that happen and as you know dr cox you know there was a lot of unity at the beginning of regional conferences you know we asked for integration we got segregation but women and such as sister justice dr eva b dykes you know were a part of that committee that addressed the concerns what would it take to get this intergenerational unity um that's needed for some of the initiatives that were discussed today um you need more than lip service. You know, we we do uh, a lot of talking. Um, back in 2016, we introduced an idea to the uh, nine regional uh, conferences. And we said, you know, in our churches, in, in, in every conference, in the bylaws, um, there is the ability for the union for the division for the gc to send delegates to our constituency meetings they have voice and vote why won't we do the same thing for those institutions that are uniquely ours we wrote a a, a manuscript in terms of how it could be put into the uh, constitution and bylaws of the nine regional conferences. This was back in 2016. As we speak today in 2023, there are only two conferences that have done it. Allegheny West Conference and Central uh, States uh, Conference yeah. where uh, Elder uh, Josiah is, okay? It's not a difficult process. We talk with um we 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 give the lip service to the fact that here are some things we can do uh -huh. in order to to grow one another um the nine regional conferences are held together by a in essence a gentleman's agreement 
And that's why you get periods where the conferences come together and do some things together and move forward and other periods when it doesn't occur. So I think the, the elephant in the room is not just giving lip service, but actually getting down to business and doing some things. And that starts off as Elder McCoy would do with one person. And he talked to, to uh, his friends and there is um, a consensus and it begins to grow from there. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we we need uh, now. So that's what I would tell you. I and disagree. I the slave the slaves will never be able to fix the plantation. The only way the slaves can fix the plantation is to get off the plantation. You can't work with the Sambo. You can't work with Uncle Tom. You can't work with the system of slavery. You have to leave the yeah. system. You can't yeah. fix the system of slavery. Slaves yeah. and uh, slaves will never fix the uh, system of slavery. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, we hear you. We hear you, brother Earl. We hear you. But I think what Dr. Cox is more referring to is a united front on our end. We're not. We're not talking about denominational. We're talking about. We're talking about financial. And and what we were able to do. And Elder Cox was there at our at our CCC session. We had some folk that weren't sure about other black institutions. Just just two. We just added two more representatives, whether it be from ORCM or retirement or another conference, you know, coming together with us. Now we were able to vote it. It takes two thirds of, of, of a vote, you know, to, 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 to change your constitution and bylaws. By God's grace, we were able to do that. Um, and, and we had support, but there was there was there's always going to be a few. There were a few people, but Earl, you mentioned it when the retirement plan, you know, came in. But the the eight conferences were so unified that when those tie dollars began to funnel away from 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 the NAD uh, uh, retirement, you know, you had a few people who didn't go along. So some of our people didn't go along. But it look at what God has done. So I think that it's it's a matter of it's a matter of us not being not being doubtful that it can happen because it's we've seen that it can be done the credit union number is a it just i'm just talking math seems to be a smaller number than even retirement the the, the dollars i'm just talking dollars so so i think stuff like this i think it is possible the more i'm hearing you brother earl and elder cox and 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 daryl and, and 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 dr amos i i think is i'm one of those Optimist, I believe is possible, but it takes it takes strategizing and it takes work, not just talking about it, but actually sitting down at the table, not knocking each other, but 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 you know when, when you do strategy, there's always got to be a naysayer in the room to say, well, what about so and so? Well, what about so and so? Well, what if so and so? Somebody that, said we don't. That's an enabler. I don't want to sit at the table with an enabler. Well, I, I think I think I Jesus can't. said, "If you're gonna build a tower, you gotta count the cost." I mean, I I don't think counting the cost is uh, uh, an uh, enabler. Uh, in, in 1961, at the 45th General Conference, Frank Hale, a layman, put together the uh, uh, Layman's Leadership Conference to change the systemic racism that was within the system. Uh -huh. Those people fought that. Those enablers fought that. Some of them are now in conference and union positions. This is a revolution. Economics is a revolution when you're talking about people of color. Wow. And until, until you embrace that and say, like Joe McCoy did, like Elder Joseph did, when, when you start to threaten and protest, you just walk away from the system. I'm not talking about walking away from the Adventist church. I'm right, not right. talking about walking away from the third angel's message. I'm talking about walking away from a system since 1844 has been racially, economically oppressive to us as a race. Well, we got to we got let's let's get the history right. So 1863 was when the church was formed and our 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 people were abolitionists. So Ellen White Joseph Page, General Conference President Byington, 
they fought against slavery. So we got we got to make sure our history. I'm saying is 1961. Accurate. Now 19. The there you go. Now that's different. The, the 1930s yeah, that's what I said. and the 1961. Okay. I didn't say 1861. I said 1961. Okay, okay. good, good, good. Just make yeah. sure I. Oh, hey, go hey ahead. Marvin, you said 18. You just meant. Yeah, you 19. said yeah. You meant 19, <laughs> yeah, but you said 1840. <laughs> hey, Kristen, I want to throw yes, something in there. Well, just what do you What do you expect from a guy in the mall on the Sabbath? I, I'm doing that's, the best. That's I can right. See. That, that's right. That's right. I, I, I was check. I was I, checking that out. I just I want you to know that. that. I wasn't going to say that. Go ahead, Dow. Go ahead, Dow. To show that this is about economics, I remember when we first uh, I uh, went down this road on this retirement plan, the only thing that mattered to the establishment was the hole that we were leaving with taking the money out. That's they didn't true. care nothing about us having our own plan. That's true. It was the money. Y'all, It when it comes to this money church, talks. <laughs> it is about money. I'm telling you, it's about money if you don't Mercy. believe it. So- Mercy. And those, there are those of us, when I first came on as a trustee three years ago, I heard these are conference presidents where the Lord wouldn't be pleased if we don't honor that commitment and put this money back. No, we shouldn't have ever. That's a whole nother conversation. A whole nother conversation. But it's an economics. Economics. It's all about economics, guys. Quick, quick question. If, if we do our own thing, and I understand what Marvin is talking about, I, you can't be more Adventist than me. That's not my issue. But my thing is, we should control our own destiny more exactly. than we do. Drop the mic. You I'm know, done. Have our own NAD, Negro Adventist uh, a delegation. You know, it, it is, when I see what we're doing, man, we're, we're missing the boat with that. We don't even own Breath of Life. Can you imagine if those great <laughs> preachers that are preaching in Breath of Life, if they were to step out on faith, if they would step out on faith, we would have the most powerful Breath of Life in the world. Somebody, we oh, got, got a question for you. I, we hear you, we hear you. So there's a, there's a question in the chat, and we don't have a lot of time. We went over our time, but this is really this is a really good conversation. Somebody in the chat asked a question, but I want to follow up on another uh, question. It says, will the GC... Um, it kind of went went away from my screen. It, the question was, will the GC, that's it, be over a credit union if the regional conferences start one? My question was actually regarding revolving funds. So oh, if, somebody can, if somebody can ask that question, I don't think the GC has anything to do with us. If we if we start a credit union, they don't have any jurisdiction over that. And I can, I can I'm a policy guy. I'm a secretary. So I can follow up on that. I don't think that'll be an issue. But what's what's the difference between a credit union getting membership, even if the members borrow money and have a, a small percentage, and a revolving fund? The revolving fund is just loaning back your money at a lower interest rate. What they did was the GC went to the banks and said, we got all of this money. We have all of these conferences. We got all of these unions. Give us X amount of dollars so we can loan it back to Daryl at a lower interest rate. I'm saying remove the middleman. So I'm what, saying walk away from that. So, so we my, my have question, our own. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm with the we have our own. I'm just wondering if a can can we start a revolving fund as, sure. as black conferences or is it a, or is a credit sure. union sure. is a credit union easier? I'm just trying to get which one is is more. I don't want to say easier, but I guess that's the way I said it. Credit union or revolving fund, or it doesn't matter. They're 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 similar. And then we're going to wrap up soon. <clears throat> the way I'm, a, the way I'll address that is, we need to have our own, whichever form exactly. we want to do. It needs to be ours. Exactly. And, and, and Christian, I want to add to that. Even when we do it, while you just said the NAD will have no jurisdiction over us, we will self-impose the right. NAD rules on it. Right. You, and you know oh, what I'm talking about with that. We'll apply those rules. We, we'll no. have our own bank, guys. If we had a and bank, that's the FBI difficulty people can't bank. get away from when you the, talk the about it. president would have to make sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year because we would want it to be the NAD rules. But this is the president of a bank. But we yeah, got we gonna pay him according to that, what that, that, that's, So, so I'm with McCoy. <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm with McCoy on that one. If 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 if, if you step because we stepped out with retirement, that's a completely different, you know. Then, then, if it's a credit union, if it's a revolving fund, 
whatever we can do that can bless our people, lower interest rates, um, you know, folk aren't getting over on us. Uh, it could be a blessing, not just it could be a blessing, not just to individuals, but even our own entities can, can, yes. can benefit. Yes. You know, our, our whether it be schools, academies, elementary schools, um, there's a lot of benefit when you can fund your own stuff, man. So Exactly. Um, Christian, can, exactly. can Dr. Linda Emmons speak? Because she's been trying to talk. I don't I know. know. Her, her, it looks like mic. she's muted. Let's, so go ahead and unmute her. We're going to try, unmute her because I, I want. I believe she has some power to tell us. We're talking about there at our at our session. We have well, we can hear the speaker of our show. We can't hear her. Just just two. Yeah, her mic. I'm, I'm hearing the feedback of yeah, our show. Yeah, the delayed yeah, feedback. Yeah, you can you can mute her again. Her. Uh, you know, uh, Elder Woods, you can. Yeah, yeah we couldn't. Now we were able to vote. Take two thirds of. Yeah, we're not hearing her. We're not hearing her. Um, ladies so and gentlemen, we, we are, but she did have some beautiful comments in the chat. Go ahead and share it. Um, I do want to make sure that we are able to hear. Um, she says, and I'm going to go back to the top. One of the problems is how things are structured. Other black denominations keep their wealth and it recirculates. Not so in the Seventh-day Adventist church. There are a number of issues that are inter interrelated beyond tithes. You cannot wait on the clergy. The people have to decide what they will do. Um, we have done a lot more historically with a lot less. What has to happen has to be a sound strategy for how to increase wealth for our communities. It is a multi-tiered problem. The retirement plan is wonderful for pastors, but our communities are more than just the church workers. Black churches have had credit unions for years. You need to research it. The revolving fund is now a private system via the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A credit union is much more than that. Um, let's see, um, That's great. as we close, I'm going to thank Dr. Ammons for sticking with us despite these technical difficulties, because you have been brilliant. You got us started, and you've done a phenomenal job. And one of the things I do want to talk about, um, L. Dr. Cox and um, Brother Darrell, before we close out, you know, the retirement plan, we keep hearing about it for workers and for pastors. It's, it's been great. But what's the next step beyond the retirement plan to help the lay people, to help the church members? And where do you when do you see that happening? And how can we get more lay people engaged um, as a part of that process? Dr. Cox, and we'll close with Brother Darrell. Well, um, you know, we we have expanded the uh, retirement um, plan to embrace local hires. So uh, local hires within um, our uh, churches, there are categories that individuals uh, within our churches are now able uh, to access. You know, one of the the challenges that the North American division uh, faced in terms of, of creating a large deficit was that the um, conferences were the only ones putting into the retirement plan. The union would put individuals into the plan, but they were not putting resources. The North American division would put individuals into the retirement plan, but no resources. The general conference would put individuals into the, um, into the um, uh, retirement plan, but no resources. And so there has to be intentionality, actuarial studies to make sure that as we are growing, we are financially able to handle the liabilities that are placed upon the plan. And, and that's what we are seeking to uh, do right now. And that, that's basically where we are. Um, one, one final comment on that. It, it is very possible, uh, and this is a part of a trustee um, question, because the trustees determine uh, for the most part 
how investments uh, are made. And it may be that there would be a, um, a pot of funds that would be invested into a um, credit union that would be beneficial to um, the whole. Um, but that's a that's a thought that would would have to be researched and and developed. Uh, Woody, thanks for that Thank that you. question. My take is a little bit different, uh, and I would like to use as a model Adventist Health Systems. Uh, it, 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 that's one of the only ones that we can you know point to, and their salaries. They hire Adventists. I know people who who work there. And I always focus on the, the, the chairman and CEO who retired years ago, the one that I knew. But what he retired with a, 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 his annual salary for life, and I'm sure there'll be cost of living adjustments with that, 800 and some thousand a year. See, I have no problem with that. I want us, I see the opportunity where that can benefit our community at large, when our kids go to Oakwood or Andrews, whatever school they go to get their degrees, man, I want to go to Huntsville and work for this uh, our regional conference retirement plan or the trustees because that's where the action is. They have created positions that I can move my family there. I can build me a home. We can build communities and, and, and have a, a, a mecca for us. We don't have, this is the only opportunity, guys, we have to do this. And 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 we're getting some serious resistance on this, but I, I'll never change, you know, from my goals. I mean, because I'm doing it in Memphis and other places. I mean, everyone in my office makes way above a living wage. You can call any of them and ask them. They all live on their own and, and do very well. They they can own homes if they choose to, but it should that shouldn't even be a choice. That you that you know you shouldn't have to say well do I eat or do I do this? People should. We have an opportunity. First, we're gonna take care of retirees. That that's the first thing. Make sure that fund is whole. But while we're doing that, we have an opportunity to create a system that will pay very well outside of church and denominational pay. Because that the, the church can't attract the quality of people that I'm talking about. And they're just, uh, they're, I wouldn't even consider working for the church if I had to provide for a family. There's nothing within our church structure that would pay enough money to provide the lifestyle that I've been blessed to live. Nothing. I'm at my, I'm at my beach home down on the Gulf Coast. There's no way in the world I can afford to do that. But what I did see is where the white Adventists retire and they could live in country clubs our guys had to go on a, a welfare and that's a problem for me and that's i don't a, that's want a, that for dr cox and for uh christian josiah i love you guys and i want you to retire with dignity i want i want to retire right where you are and and man i yes, call sir. me naive i want everybody to do well I, and i believe that that's that's not pie in the sky those who want to do well should have the opportunity to do it and and that's that's my goal and no one's gonna kill that that dream Dr. Adams, that, I think we can hear you. Go you ahead. Can finally, hear me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. If now I can only remember what I was going to say. Might be helpful. But what I was going to say is, I think you've talked about a number of things tonight uh, in terms of uh, the way the the revenue structure as it relates to the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And the reason why I bring the historical point up is this: if you remember that uh if if our wealth is only uh, is is uh if, if their wealth is 13 times more than ours that's that's something you have to deal with right then and there the question becomes what is fair and what is equitable uh in terms of what is required from these various communities who have so less wealth than other communities that's why the mm -hmm. the other brethren can be the country clubs is because they inherit wealth um, historically, we have not been able to do that. And, and in addition to understanding that it's really the people, when you look at people who are wealthy in this country, they're not people who are working for other folk. They're people who own things. Um, and so, uh, and education is very important. Uh, yeah. They educate and then they own. That's how you get wealth. But, uh, but you also have to unravel the morass uh, as, as it relates to not only 
um, soci in the, the larger society in terms of black wealth, but what happens within the church and what we're asking people to do in terms of um, uh, uh, supporting our particular church structures. One of the things that I'll be very quick that I've noticed um, in terms of across the board is that African-Americans in general and Seventh-day Adventist African-Americans in specific really don't understand as much as we should about philanthropy and what it takes to be philanthropic and not only in terms of giving, but stewarding those gifts so that they yeah. turn into uh, investments that have perpetuity, um, not only for our individual families, but for institutions. All of those things need to be taught. They don't just happen through happenstance. Um, our, our other brothers and sisters, they have had that legacy passed down, passed down, passed down. And so it is innate in terms of what they know, how they know how to do it. The other thing is, as long as you ask for permission, you will be asking for permission. And it puts the clergy in a very difficult position because their paychecks come from the people that you have to ask permission for. Oh, now that's not that's not to denigrate our pastors. Oh, it's just a right. it's just a fact it's of life. reality. Yeah, like reality. If you dance to the music, you got to pay the pulper to a certain extent. And the the brilliance of the retirement fund was one time when when the when the, when the preacher said we ain't dancing to this tune no more. But that was very bold and courageous. I don't know in these days and time whether you have the, the clergy constituency in terms of other going beyond that. And maybe you don't need it. As I said before, movements happen basically by the people. You don't wait necessarily on your, you hope your leadership is out leading you, but if they ain't, then, then yeah, yeah, yeah. the people need to help the, give the leadership help in terms of what it is that we need to do. And that's a much bigger, broader uh -huh. conversation that uh -huh. needs to take multi-layered conversation as it relates to economics, beginning with how our church is set up in terms of the economics of who pays what and when. You've done it the first out, uh, out of the shoot with the retirement fund. That's, that, that is a prime example of what can be done and the analysis that was done to get that done. Now the next step is, from my perspective as a lay person, what are we doing in the communities, not only for our community, but for people within our church communities? Here's a question I always ask. If the churches were to disappear off the corner for wherever we are, would anybody really care? Mm -hmm. And we have examples, not necessarily in our denomination. If we do, I'm just not aware of them. But we have examples of black denomination uh, churches all around the country who have done things to kind of undergird uh, their uh, economic base. Now, again, I do understand they get to keep it all. So that makes a difference. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to yes, be sir. able to say. You have to correctly analyze the question before you provide an answer. If you don't analyze it correctly, you'll get, it, you'll get the wrong answer. And that's what we need to do. And I'm glad for this opportunity to do the analysis. Now we need to get to work. And uh, Kristen, I want to respond to one thing. Dr. Ammons, I, I can sum up what you just said as I ask people, do you sign the front of the check or the back of it? Mm. All right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, hey, look, as you can hey, see, Bo, we've, got, we've got some great people here today that have get, dropped some knowledge, and, and, and he summed it up Where very practically. If you want to create wealth, all I got to ask you do you sign the front of the check? Or do you sign That's the it. back of the check? Drop the mic. We want literally. to thank Dr. William T. Cox Sr., the executive director of the Regional Retirement Plan, for coming on. We want to thank Dr. Linda L. Ammons, the Dean Emeritus, Widener <laughs> University in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Perseverance. Perseverance, she showed mightily, but she was ready, she was prepared, and she was excellent. Excellent. We yes, want to thank, thank Dr. Faba Kwesi for introducing our new sister for the Conscious and Justice Council because we're going to come back and get her again. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We're going to use she her. Was, she was fantastic. Yeah. want to thank Marvin Earl, wherever he was, for honoring his <laughs> commitment to coming on and sharing what he had to share. But we want to thank him. And last but not least, we want to thank Daryl K. Absolutely. Thomas. 
yes, of sir. Thomas Consulting in Memphis, Tennessee, for coming and just being direct. You know, that's what our young people like. Someone that's, that's going to be direct and that's tell it. it like it like it is. And you definitely did that. And then last but not least, my partner in crime, our co-host, our CJC secretary, Elder Christian I still, Josiah. I still got a job. Man, I still got a job. I still got they, a job. They, 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 want, they kicked me out, Jim. <laughs> well, you still have a job. And we just want everybody to know next week, I repeat, next week, um, Pastor Jerome Hurst, who's our CJC vice chairperson, has recruited Pastor Marvin McMichael, the interim regional executive minister for the Cleveland Baptist Association, to be with us next week. You are not going to want to miss this. You're not going to want to miss this powerful preacher that will be speaking next week. Um, Pastor Marvin McNichol, Interim Regional Executive Minister for the Cleveland Baptist Association. Uh -huh. and, and then two weeks from today, two weeks from today, we're going to analyze the book from the authors, A House on Fire, A House on Fire. Um, it was edited by Dr. Maury Jackson and Nathan Brown. And we'll also have some of the writers. Our colleague, Dr. Zach Plantek, will be hosting that show. So once again, every Friday night, the Conscience and Justice Council is celebrating Black history, adopting the theme Black Resistance. And we did it today with Black Wealth. We did it last week with Dr. Burton. And we have two more, I repeat, two more shows to go. Once again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to our guests. Have a happy Sabbath. And if you want to go back, if you want to go back and hear this broadcast or any broadcast of the Conscious and Justice Council, we invite you to go to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. Matter of fact, subscribe to our YouTube channel so every time we come on, you'll get notified. God bless you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank you.